No doubt some of you are gonna be grumpy with me for kind of defending the position and the pricing of this one. And that's actually not my intention so much as just to say that we don't always know the full picture. I think it's an amplifier, as I'll explain in a moment, that is going to suit some people insanely well and just be a bad choice for other people. Hey folks, welcome to another Passion for Sound audio review. Today we're taking a look at the Enlium Amp 23R. This is an insanely expensive headphone amp and speaker amp, and it's one of those things where sometimes things all tend to happen at once in the reviewer world. It's not coordinated or discussed at all, but it was really interesting that the day I went to pick up the demo unit here of the Amp 23R, that was the same day that Golden Sounds review came out on this same device. And so by pure chance, I was listening to this for the first time at about the same time as I also watched his video on this one. And the reason for that was that there were a few issues that he raised in his review, and I was really keen to find out a bit more about them and decide for myself if it was a problem, if it was okay, if it helped the sound quality. In other words, if there were trade-offs that I was happy to have within a design like this one. And so I've got a fair bit to cover in this review. And I want to start off by making something really clear. I'm not here to try to debunk Golden Sound's review. I don't disagree with anything he really said in there, but I do want to provide some extra context and clarity for those of you that might've been a bit turned off by it. I certainly had some questions raised and many of those questions, not all of them, but many of them have been answered in my time with the Amp 23R and through discussions with the designer. <laughs> in at a whopping $6,250 for just an amp, this is a pretty insanely priced piece of kit. Having said that, I've got at least two channel patrons, one who owns one, one who's listened to one. I've got at least two that really enjoy what they've heard from the Amp 23R, and that was part of why I was so interested in trying it. The Amp 23R will put out 25 watts into eight ohms as a speaker amp, and I know that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but I don't think the Amp 23R is designed as an amplifier for big, big rooms necessarily. It's not to say that it can't drive an efficient speaker within a large room, but my point is more that it's really, I think at its best in a setup somewhat like mine. And that's where you've got a pair of really nice near field listening speakers. I've recently got the Harbeth P3 ESR XDs in. I'll be reviewing them soon, so make sure you subscribe. Passion for Sound is finally getting into speakers, so make sure you hit that subscribe button if you wanna see my speaker content. But I think this is really where the Amp 23R has the potential to shine. And that is in a system where you're doing a lot of headphone listening and also a lot of near field or compact room speaker listening. While we're talking power, it's also worth noting that this also puts out four watts into a 50 ohm load. So for those of you with a Susvara or an Abyss 1266, this could be a brilliant amplifier. And I do also have the Abyss 1266s coming, so I'll be testing them on the Amp 23R when I get them in for a play. Another thing that's related to power is the amount of gain the amplifier has. And this is something I really like. It's got a gain level of seven decibels for headphones. And what that means is that your volume range is actually very manageable. A lot of the super powerful headphone amps on the market can really struggle to give you enough range to move between both sensitive headphones, maybe even IMs, and then go all the way up to your difficult headphones. And that's something I find the Amp 23R does very, very well. It's a little bit limited for IEMs, but not undoable. There is another issue though, we'll talk about that one separately in a minute. But overall, I love the implementation of the volume and the gain. It's great for speakers, it's great for headphones. Before I get into a tour of the device, and then of course also talk about how it performs and some of those questions that the Golden Sound Review brought up, 
I just want to talk briefly about some of the key design ideas behind this. And this is all coming from the marketing side of things. This is not me saying necessarily, or you'll know when I am saying whether I think something's good or bad, but I'm just sharing with you what Enlium talk about as their benefits within the AMP23R. Firstly, it's a zero feedback design. And what that means is that they're not feeding the signal back on itself to cancel out noise. That can have both pros and cons. Obviously, one of the drawbacks is that it's not going to measure as well as amplifiers using feedback. It also means that technically there is going to be more distortion coming through. But on the benefit side of things, something I've discovered when playing with zero feedback amps is that they often sound more natural. I haven't yet gotten to the bottom of why feedback seems to change the sense of naturality in the sound, but it almost always does. It doesn't mean feedback is bad. There is some amazing feedback using amplifiers on the market, without a doubt. But it is something that I'm always interested to try out because I think when zero feedback is done really well, it can be even better than a feedback design done well. And so that was one thing I was curious to hear in the Amp 23R. But then the other things that are marketed and things that I can't directly comment on as to what I've heard are things like the fact that it uses an ultra wide frequency range performance and an ultra fast performance, meaning that it can technically amplify a larger range of sound than what you're able to hear, and also that it can respond very, very fast to changes in the musical signal. Now they're not things that I can verify, so I'm just sharing what's on the website. The Amp 23R also has a fancy biasing circuit, and what that means is it's basically going to be constantly watching the performance of the transistors and adjusting them in real time. So what that means is that as a transistor is under more load, as it gets warmer or cooler, it starts to perform differently. And so what the fancy circuit inside the Amp 23R is doing is constantly monitoring the performance of those transistors and adjusting them so they're always performing exactly as they should. And so theoretically what that should mean is that at any level of volume, music signal complexity, different loads on the amplifier, at any of those different variables going on, it should be performing exactly the same. And so you should get really consistent performance on quiet passages, loud passages, your headphones, your speakers, sensitive speakers, more difficult speakers, all of those should perform exactly the same. The final thing that's talked about on the website is an improved power supply. And obviously that's a really key part of an amplifier, particularly an amplifier for speakers where it needs to deliver significant amounts of voltage. That's in relation to the previous Amp 13R, which was made, I think, by Bakun rather than Enlium. So Enlium is basically like a spin-off from Bakun. They've dropped the Bakun brand and become Enlium. And so theoretically, a better power supply should mean better delivery of the musical signal out to your transducers, whether they're headphones or whether they're speakers. But with all that sort of specifications and marketing stuff out of the way, let's talk now about the actual design of the amplifier, which first and foremost is absolutely spectacular to look at and feel. But let's talk about what's going on here. As I do, I'm going to put aside this remote control. I just do want to mention it's a beautiful piece of engineering in itself. It is very square and a little tiny bit pointy at the corners, but it's a really nice remote control and lovely to have with a device like this if you want to sit back in an armchair perhaps and listen to your headphones or your speakers. For me, in a desktop system, it's really not necessary, but it's a nice inclusion for those that have a different setup to me. The other little accessory that I want to mention these guys here, these little silicon discs come with the amplifier and they're to stop it sliding around on your desktop. So depending on your system and the surface you're placing it on, you might want to put these under the feet. I would have liked to see some way that these could be attached to the feet. I don't know if there's a reason from a vibration point of view that they shouldn't be, but it is a little bit of a hassle to place the amp and then have to sort of lift it up and put each of these under to get them in just the right spots. But at least they're provided and once they're in place, they do a great job. And the reason for that, just to show you, is that it's very easy to slide the amp once it's on a hard surface like my desk here. And so I totally get why they're included, but as I said, I'm not sure why they weren't put underneath the actual feet as a permanent attachment or some sort of lip on the silicon pad that will hold it to the foot as you move it around. I'm not sure. As I said, maybe there was a reason. It wasn't one of the questions that I asked the designer of the Enlium, but let's segue that now into why they're even necessary. The Amp 23R has this really interesting, and sorry about the rattles, a really interesting foot system. As you can see, they're very offset on the amplifier, and apparently the positioning of these feet has been very carefully chosen. It's all about balancing the actual weight of the amp and where the different heavy spots are. And these feet just screw on and screw off, so you don't technically need to have them on there. There are little rubber feet, but I think it's probably recommended to put them on there from a ventilation point of view, and they're also a vibration damping foot. Moving on from the feet though, before my arm drops off, because this thing's heavy. On the front of the Amp 23R, things are pretty simple. All we've got is going on on this side of the amplifier. There's nothing over here, as you can see, other than the logo and the name of the amp. And then we've got kind of a multi-function setup here. You've got a power button at the top, which is a standby button, but it's also your source input switching button. And there's three inputs, which we'll look at on the back in a moment. 
Below that, you've got your 6.3 mil headphone output. This is a single in it only as an amplifier. And then finally, you've got your volume control. And I say volume control, but it's actually a gain control. And we'll talk about that in a bit of detail shortly, but the quick version of it is that this amplifier doesn't adjust the volume of the signal coming into the amp and therefore going to the gain stage. It allows the full signal to always come in and then it adjusts the gain. So when you're turning this knob, you're changing the gain of the amp, not the volume or not the attenuation amount of the incoming signal. But as I said, we'll get to that more in a moment. Moving around to the back of the amp now. And on the back of the amp, what we've got is a pair of binding posts with some really nice high quality connectors. Those are obviously for your speakers. We've got an IEC power socket over here. So this is gonna accept a normal mains connection. And then along the bottom here, we've got two pairs of RCAs and a pair of BNC connectors. Now the BNC connectors there are for an Enlium specific design where it's gonna have a DAC ISU, maybe a streamer, I'm not sure, but some sort of external device that is going to connect to the Amp 23R with a current input rather than voltage input. And I'm assuming that's gonna maximize the way that the Amp 23R works because currently what happens is when you're sending voltage in through the RCA sockets, now obviously everything includes both voltage and current, that's what makes up a signal, but when you're sending a voltage-based signal through the RCA sockets, internally the amp is actually doing a conversion into a current-based signal. And I don't really yet understand how that works from a physics point of view. My understanding is it's more about having the current vary and the voltage stay more consistent, but I haven't looked into it in detail. With a traditional signal, your current stays pretty much the same and your voltage is the thing that fluctuates. So I think it's just inverting that, but I haven't researched it yet. And so as you can see, the Amp 23R is pretty simple in terms of its inputs, outputs, functions, etc. It takes a total of three inputs potentially if you have an Enlium input that uses the Enlium BNCs. And it gives you just a simple option of having speaker outputs or headphone outputs. It's a muting headphone socket. So when you plug in your headphones, it mutes the speakers. And when you unplug it, the speakers play. And so there's not a lot of bells and whistles, there's not a lot of features, but it is still an expensive amp. So we do need to get to the sound quality shortly to see if it actually justifies its price. But before we get there, I do wanna cover off a few of the questions that were raised in the Golden Sound Review. If you're trying to work out what piece of gear you should buy next, then the Passion for Sounds Recommends database might be helpful for you. In the description box of every single video, just down here, you'll find the Passion for Sounds Recommends section. If you click on this link, it'll take you through to the Passion for Sounds Recommends Airtable database. What you'll see in here is every single product that I've ever reviewed and recommend, in some cases products that I own but maybe haven't reviewed but recommend. And then once you're in here, you can use the filter button up here to decide to filter by things like whether or not the product type is for a headphone, for example. So maybe you're looking for a headphone. Filter it by that and you can now see every headphone I recommend. You can sort it by price, which is the default sorting or any other sorting method that you want. And then once you've got the list of products you're looking for, you've got the links to the reviews of the products and then also purchasing links for global retailers and also regional retailers for the US, Australia, Canada and the UK. So feel free to play around with this, sort it, filter it however you want to. It won't affect what anybody else sees and you can hopefully find just the right products for you. I hope this is helpful and now let's get back to the review. One of the concerns that Cameron raised, and I do want to reiterate here, there is absolutely no beef between me and Cameron. I'm not looking to call him out on this one. It raised questions for me. I went looking for answers and I wanted to share them with you. And as you'll see, I'm not debunking anything he said. I actually agree with him, but I wanted to provide more explanation or provide more understanding of why it's going on. So one of the first things that caught my eye and definitely one of the issues that I have with the amplifier, it's a very minor issue, but I do believe it's an issue, is the DC offset when you're changing the gain. So remember, turning the volume here is actually changing gain, not technically the volume. And that's because, as I said before, a normal system will be attenuating the signal coming in. So the voltage enters the amplifier, the attenuator of whatever sort's being used, whether it's a relay attenuator or a potentiometer. When you're turning that, what it's doing is it's actually deciding how much of that input voltage is getting through to the gain stage. So it's almost like if we think about a car analogy, it's almost like you've got your engine running at full tilt the whole time and you're deciding how much petrol gets to it. It's a pretty bad analogy, but that's kind of the idea where the gain stage in most amplifiers is always running at full tilt. So if it's a 12 dB gain, it's always producing 12 dB gain. And what you're changing is the amount of the voltage, the amount of signal, the amount of level that's getting into that gain stage to then be amplified. That's completely different here, where if you've got two volts coming in, two volts is going into the gain stage, and then you're deciding with the turn of the gain knob whether or not that two volts is being increased, kept the same, etc. 
And so that's where the DC offset issue is coming from. Now, if you're not familiar with DC offset, that's the sound of a crack or a pop through your headphones or your speakers when you're changing the volume in this case. It's the same sort of sound that you might sometimes hear turning certain units on or off, particularly with active monitors. And the reason it's an issue here is that this gain control is actually placed after the input stage. When you combine the fact that it's after the input stage, in other words, it's a part of the amplification circuit, you could say, combine that with the fact that we're running a zero feedback design, so there's no feedback to try to remove any noise that's introduced, and what you get is that little bit of a click every time the relays change the gain level, that click has no way of being removed in a zero feedback design. And so the result is that we do hear little clicks and pops. But this is where things get a little bit nuanced for me. I know that Cameron was concerned that this could actually cause damage to a headphone or an earphone, but there were two ways that I wanted to address that for my own comfort. Firstly, I asked the designer and he said that they've been using this exact same design for multiple years now, I think he said 10 years or so, and they've never had it cause a problem with a headphone. And I do believe they'd tell us if they had had any returns, if somebody had come to them and said, I've had a blown up headphone, I think we would have heard about it on forums as well. And most manufacturers that have had problems like this, the normal response is to say, yes, it has been a problem and we've always replaced the headphone. We've paid for repairs, etc. So the fact that the designer of the Enlium has come back and said they've never had a blown up headphone does give me some comfort. But then to take that a step further, because, you know, sometimes it's just marketing, to take that a step further, I did also want to test it for myself. And so I chose some sacrificial earphones and some sacrificial headphones, and I basically switched on the amplifier and just cranked the volume to see what would happen. Because what is happening is as you're changing the volume, that's where the DC is coming through. And so even with no signal present, with the music switched off, meaning I could turn it as loud as I wanted to, you're still going to get those little cracks and pops because they're coming from the relay switching. And so as I said, I tried with IEMs, sensitive headphones, dynamic driver headphones, planar magnetic headphones, and none of them within normal listening ranges were getting uncomfortable. The one time things did start to get uncomfortable was if you chose to use a DAC with a preamp functionality and adjust the volume there. So let's say you pulled the output level of the DAC way, way down, and then you're cranking the volume more on the Enlium, and there's a reason for that that we'll get to soon. If you were doing that, by the time you're getting to about 12 o'clock or beyond on the volume range or the gain range, IEMs will start to get a bit uncomfortable. So it is worth being aware of, but I don't believe it's a deal breaker. And it also did nothing that would make me concerned that it's going to damage the headphones. One of the things that the designer mentioned to me in his email was that the DC doesn't remain there. It's a quick momentary pop and then it returns back to zero. And that's really the issue with DC, unless it's a really extreme pop. The issue with DC offset is more if it holds the driver at a fixed position. And so basically what's going on is a driver is translating the electrical energy into movement and if that movement is already to the extreme and the driver can go no further, that's when it goes from being translated into movement to translated into heat. You then cook your voice coil and you blow up your driver. And so the fact that this is a brief momentary pop and then returning to normal means it's not going to cause damage. The other thing that I would add is that even though the noise is a little bit unnatural, it's not a musical sound, it's a sharp crack or a pop. Another thing that I'd add is I was listening recently to the track Black Shoes by Felix LeBand. And that track actually includes these sorts of sounds as part of its rhythm, as part of its percussion. And I'd say that the sounds coming through in Black Shoes are more uncomfortable and more kind of direct and snappy than the sounds that come out of the Enlium's volume control. So the short version of this is, yes, it does it. I think ideally it wouldn't do it. I prefer not to hear those sounds, but it's by no means bad enough that it's uncomfortable. It's never going to cause damage. And as I said, unless you're using sensitive IEMs, cranking the volume really, really high because you pulled the volume on your DAC really low, unless you're doing that, you're really never going to have an issue with it. And so hopefully that clarifies that one. As I said, that to me is the biggest issue with the amplifier. And I agree with Golden Sound for calling it out as a potential issue but I also don't think it's big enough to get hung up upon and avoid the amplifier as a result of. And so let's move on now to a couple of other concerns raised in the Golden Sound review just really quickly. One of them was that the amplifier showed high levels of distortion with a two volt signal. And that indeed is true. I confirmed that with the manufacturer, he said the same thing. I also tried the listening test that Golden Sound recommended where you pull back the output level of your DAC and then listen via the amplifier. And indeed, I did feel like having, say, in my case, the TT2 backed off a little bit and then using a higher volume level on the amplifier to kind of match the levels to what it would have been before. I do think that might have sounded just a little tiny bit better. But at the same time, it's also worth noting something that the designer pointed out, and that is that the amplifier, when it's receiving a musical signal, is not receiving a consistent two volts. 
And so in the real world, you're going to be having a range of voltages coming in as the musical signal fluctuates. And so what I'd say from that experience is that if you do want to pull back the signal a little bit from your DAC, it's probably going to give you a slightly better sound. But at the same time, you do need to be careful not to go too far back because if you get the voltage too low, the amplifier is also not going to perform at its best if it's trying to boost the signal from a very, very low voltage. And so for me with the TT2, I'd probably back it off maybe 5 dB, 6 dB, and it was giving me nice results without having to crank the gain too much and make the amplifier work too hard on really quiet sections. So do keep that one in mind. I don't really bother too much about pulling back the gain on the TT2. I think the difference is minimal and it's one of those things that you're only noticing if you're looking for it. But I do agree that it's there. I do agree that it's just a little bit audible, but not a big deal. Now I was just about to move on to the next section and I could hear a few of you screaming in my head already that it's a $6,000 amplifier and therefore shouldn't have any of these issues. And whilst I kind of get where you're coming from, I also think it's really important to note that every single device on the planet has some compromises where those compromises are made, how those compromises are made, those are all things that are up to you to decide whether you're okay with. And for me, the end result of listening to an amplifier like this one is about whether I enjoy the sound. And I haven't got to that yet, I will get to it very soon, but that's ultimately the measure for me. And so far what we've talked about, the issues with a little bit more distortion at 2 volts and the clicking of the gain control, neither of those things can prevent me from enjoying the music if the music sounds good. Of course, if the distortion makes it sound bad, that's another story, but we'll get to that soon. And you can probably already guess where I'm going with this, which is that it doesn't sound bad at all. But I think it's really important to note that the decisions made here have been made deliberately. They're deliberate compromises. By having a zero feedback design, you can't get rid of the DC pop. But on the other hand, the designer believes it's producing a better sound quality. Likewise, the performance at 2 volts, for whatever reason, is something to do with the design of the circuit. And again, the design of the circuit has been done deliberately to produce the sound that it does. It's also been done in the knowledge that a musical signal doesn't sit permanently at 2 volts. And so all of these things you need to take into account in the bigger picture of things. Rather than pulling apart one individual issue and saying it shouldn't do that, for me at least, it's more about how does the end result perform. And so we'll get to that in a second, but I want to cover off one more thing because this is probably one area where I don't agree with what Golden Sound said. And that is talking about the bill of goods for this amplifier. I think the moment we break down any product in this market down to its bill of goods, its cost of production, I think we're doing a disservice to the designs. Certainly there were no doubt some things in this amplifier that had been developed to a degree for the Amp 13R, but then they've all been upgraded and improved for the 23R. This is not the same amplifier as the 13R, just in a new case. Each of the different circuits and features within the Amp 23R are an upgraded version. And so things like that may seem small on paper. It may seem like someone's just kind of changed a capacitor here or changed a resistor there and they're charging the same amount for it. But there was probably a great deal of R&D that went into that. There would have been different circuit designs, listening tests, time, effort, changing things around. And that's a part of any device as well. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not sitting here saying that we should pay a fortune for gear just because designers want to charge it. It absolutely has to perform to the level that we're comfortable paying for. But my point is that breaking down any device by how much it costs to put together is kind of like saying that a Ferrari shouldn't cost as much as it does because you can buy all the individual parts for less. And I'm sure you could. If you wanted to go out and buy yourself the pieces to make a Ferrari, I'm sure that you could absolutely do that. But whether or not you know how to put them together optimally, whether or not you're able to put them together at all, whether or not you even know which parts you should have bought in the first place, that's all of what goes into making a product like this one, or any for that matter. And this is true whether or not we're talking about a $6,000 amplifier or a $300 DAC. All of them have a level of R&D, a level of design, a level of thought. All of them have that that's gone into them. The extent of that design and thought could be vastly different between them, but ultimately that's what we're paying for, and it's ultimately also the end performance that we're paying for. Again, I don't know that the parts cost to build a Ferrari is that much greater than the parts cost to build a regular car in terms of the proportional difference, but if the performance is there at the end, people are happy to pay for it. And so again, I'm not sitting here defending pricing. I'm not sitting here defending any particular product. It's just a practice that I'm uncomfortable seeing in this hobby because I think it oversimplifies what goes into every single device out there, particularly the more bespoke kind of custom design products. It's one thing to look at it when you're talking about mass-produced products that are being pumped out of a factory somewhere, but when they're carefully designed, carefully crafted products that obviously are still made in a factory somewhere, but with a lot of design and research and thought behind them, I think that's where I get a bit uncomfortable with it, and I just want to draw attention to it. Again, not trying to create beef with Golden Sound, and I'm not having a dig here. 
I just wanted to put a different perspective to it and a different piece of context. And so one final point before I move on from this is that when I actually emailed and asked the designer some questions, one of the things I did mention was about the cost of building them. And I actually really liked what he came back with. One of the things he said was that all of the decisions made within the Amp 23R have been based on obviously design principles and then listening tests. And he said that in many cases they've avoided kind of audiophile voodoo as he called it. And so things like the capacitors that were pointed out in the Golden Sound review that are relatively cheap, those were chosen because of their compact size and large capacitance. They met the specs that were needed and didn't influence the sound quality. Whereas at another moment, he's used expensive Mundorf wiring in here because that obviously made a difference to the end result. And so they're the sorts of things that I think we don't always think about. The careful thought, the careful consideration, the testing. And so I'll leave that there. No doubt some of you are going to be grumpy with me for kind of defending the position and the pricing of this one. And that's actually not my intention so much as just to say that we don't always know the full picture. There are some products that I think are overpriced. There are some products that I don't think are overpriced. And then there's other products like this one, just to let the cat out of the bag a bit, where I think the price is very contextual. I think it's an amplifier, as I'll explain in a moment, that is going to suit some people insanely well and just be a bad choice for other people. And so to get into that now, let's start talking about sound quality. One of the very first things I noticed when I fired up the Amp 23R, and this was initially all with headphones, one of the very first things I noticed was that it has this wonderful crispness to the leading edge of notes, but no aggression. It's a smooth amp, but a highly articulate amplifier, and that's something that I absolutely love in audio systems. Vocals and mid-range come across rich and smooth, but there's no sense of thickness to it for me. You can still hear all the texture, the breath, little mouth sounds, etc. And so you've got this lovely balance of texture and detail, but also resonance too. When we get down into the bass, it's delivered with a sense of tightness and control, but also plenty of body. So this amp is going to deliver punch when the music calls for it. It's going to be able to give you that impact and that drama, but it's done in a generally quite tight way. It's not a loose, woolly bass. Having said that, I'm going to give you some comparisons shortly as to how some other amps perform. It's different to some other amplifiers, and some of you are going to prefer a different sound. But for me, I was loving everything I was hearing to this point, because the treble was smooth but extended and detailed, lovely sense of articulation and attack with no aggression. As I said, that lovely balance of texture and body in the mid-range, bass that was tight and impactful, the bass also went really deep really easily, and overall the tonality and timbre of the amplifier for me was just natural. Everything sounds realistic, it sounds true to life, it actually sounds quite eerie sometimes, and that's a combination for me of a natural timbre, but also the image placement. The sounds just kind of pop out of nowhere with this amplifier, it's really spectacular. I've heard people talk about black backgrounds before, and it's not a term I tend to use very much because I think any amp that's silent kind of has a black background. But the difference for me in going to something like the Amp 23R is the way the sounds just kind of pop to life in the space that they're in. It's not more quiet or more silent than the Burson Soloist GT behind me or the headphone output from the Chord TT2, but somehow each sound has this sense of focus and precision in its placement in space that's just magical from the Amp 23R. It's an absolute highlight for me when listening to it. The soundstage size and shape is also fantastic, again very, very natural. And of course that will depend on your speakers and your headphones, but it does a wonderful job with a good set of speakers or headphones at producing a very natural soundstage. In other words, what that means is it's got a good sense of width, a good sense of depth, and a nice kind of spherical shape. Some amplifiers, some systems can produce more of a triangular stage or a flatter stage. This just has this lovely sense of sphericality to it. I don't know if that's a word, but it's what it's doing. And then as I've already talked about, imaging accuracy and placement is nothing short of exceptional for me. And all that translates to an amplifier that for me has been absolutely brilliant with everything I've tried it on. Whether it's classical, whether it's rock, funk, jazz, blues, acoustic, it just sounds wonderful. And so rather than carry on about the sound quality in isolation, the biggest question for me was, can it justify its price tag? I've got other amps here that are both speaker amps and headphone amps, something like the Elekit TU8200R or the Linear Tube Audio MZ3. I've also got very powerful headphone amps like the Burson Soloist GT. I had the Past Labs HPA1 here at the same time as well. And so for me, that was the biggest question is, can this justify its price? Is it better than those? Is it different enough from those in a way that's going to be beneficial for many people to justify that price tag? And so let's go through now and do some comparisons to put this in context of kind of how it performs with some other high-level devices. 
Now, it's probably worth a reminder that if you want to know my full thoughts and sort of see me go through the process of forming these thoughts as I listen to the AMP 23R and compared it to these others, I've got a behind the scenes review of this one, which is literally me talking, thinking out loud and typing my notes as I listen to this one. That's available over on Patreon. If you're interested, jump over there and check that out. But for now, let's start off with the first comparison, and that's the Cord TT2 headphone outputs. So for now, we're just talking about headphone performance. And with the TT2 driving headphones, both the ZMF Calderas and the ZMF Atriums, one of the first tracks that I tried was Human by Christina Perry. And what was interesting to me was that this recording's kind of a good recording, but it's also a slightly sterile or clinical recording. And as I jumped between the TT2 headphone output and the Enlium headphone output, I wasn't finding as vast of a difference as I expected to. And indeed, depending on whether I was listening to the Calderas or the Atriums, it kind of changed which one I preferred more or less. I should add that the reason I chose the Atrium and the Caldera for this test was purely because I wanted to have a high quality dynamic driver and also a high quality planar magnetic driver. Also a slightly difficult planar magnetic driver. The Caldera isn't hard to drive, but it's not as easy as some others. But rest assured that I've also tried this across a whole bunch of other products. I've used the Meta Elites on it. I've used the Hyferman HE1000SE. I might have tried the HE1000 Stealth as well. I've used the Sennheiser HD660 S2. You name it, if I've got it here, it's probably had a go on the AMP23R. So what I'm sharing with you now is a test with just the Atrium and Caldera, but it's also aligned with my thinking from all those other devices I've tried it with. And so as I was saying, between the TT2 and the AMP23R, the differences weren't drastic starting off with human. I felt like the AMP23R delivered a slightly better sense of the bass in the track. It was interesting that when I then switched to the Atrium, the distinction kind of went the other way, where I felt like the Atrium performed better in terms of the bass presence, at least, on the TT2 compared to the Enlium. And I also felt like some of the fine details were a bit more present, a bit more evident from the TT2. That's one of the strengths of the TT2, is it brings out every little detail in the mix. And yet when I went over to the Enlium, I was finding that those things were pulled back a little bit. They were still there. They were a bit less obvious and a bit less present. But at the same time, things like separation, the sense of space in the soundstage and the separation of those individual sounds was a bit better. But ultimately, I got to this point in my initial testing and I was kind of questioning whether or not the Enlium was actually worth the extra. And so I decided to try another track because sometimes the track is the thing that influences what we're hearing. And indeed, in this case, it's absolutely what was going on. I moved over to Bad Guy by Billie Eilish. This is the version with Justin Bieber. And suddenly I was hearing the magic that I'd been experiencing with the Amp 23R in my general listening beforehand. And specifically, it's that in this track, there are some vocals delivered on the left and right channels that's a little bit like the singer, in this case Billie Eilish, is whispering or singing gently into both ears. And with the Amp 23R, it's like you can feel the breath. And I'm, I don't mean that as hyperbole. What I mean is the sense of articulation and the attack on the leading edges of notes from the Amp 23R is just so magic. You can feel those moments of the, the breath, the per, the burp, sounds like that. Those are so well defined from the Amp 23R that you feel them through the drivers of the headphones and into your ears. On the TT2, all that stuff is there and defined, but you're not getting that same sense of articulation and energy. Again, I found that the atriums here performed maybe a little bit better on the TT2. They suited it sound better. And that could be because the Atrium is a warmer headphone and therefore the more kind of dry, neutral sound of the TT2 helps it to bring out the detail a bit more. Whereas the Calderas already have a nice sense of kind of energy and clarity up top and that's where maybe they're better off with the Amp 23R. All I can tell you at this point is that having lived with the Amp 23R and the TT2 for a couple of weeks now, I definitely always want to plug into the Amp 23R. No matter what the headphone is, no matter what I'm listening to, the Amp 23R is my choice over and above the TT2. And that's a big statement because for a long time, my preference has always been to the TT2. Over the Soloist GT, over the Headamp GSX Mark II when I had it, over the HPA1 when I had it, the TT2 has just consistently been my go-to. But now the Amp 23R is very much stealing that space. And so from there, I wanted to try another amplifier, and this time it was the Burson Soloist GT. I was curious to see if just the sheer levels of power that both of these had put them on a similar playing field. And one of the tracks that happened to come on here was not the Doctor by Alanis Morissette. Using the atriums on the Amp 23R to start with, and the opening guitar was nicely articulate and clear and had a good sense of attack to it. The vocal was once again really natural and pure and well-placed. What I mean by pure is it didn't sound coloured or artificial in any way. And there's a bass sound in the right channel of this track 
that it sounds like a bass being plucked with a wobbly string. And you could hear that really clearly, all the detail, you could hear where it was in space. It was all beautifully defined from the Amp 23R. Moving over to the GT, still with the atriums, and the guitar was crisper from the GT. The hi-hat was also more obvious, and I felt like the vocals had a bit more texture to them as well. Having said that, because you might be thinking that's all good stuff, having said that, it all came across a bit less realistic. Somehow all those things were just a bit too much. It was almost a little bit overdone. And if you know me, you'll know that I really, really like the Soloist GT. It stayed with me as a reference amplifier ever since I got it. And on this occasion, everything that it brought out in terms of the texture and the detail and those sorts of extra little bits of energy, they all went just a little bit too far and made it less natural. I couldn't wait to come back to the Amp 23R, not because the GT is bad, but because the Amp 23R is just so lifelike. That kind of loose string bass sound that I spoke about before, that was still evident on the GT. It's not as though the Amp 23R is somehow pulling out detail that nothing else is pulling out. But that sound was a bit less real from the GT. It was one of those situations where the listening to the GT reminded me that I was listening to a recording, whereas listening to the Amp 23R, I was just listening to music. Moving over to the Calderas, in case there was a bit of a kind of planar or dynamic difference here. Moving over to the Calderas, I felt like the Calderas were even better again. And what I mean by that is that the Amp 23R, everything I just said about the atriums being good with the Amp 23R and probably a little bit better than the GT, that was even greater in this case with the Calderas. So in both cases, I preferred the Amp 23R over the Soloist GT. With the Planar Magnetic Calderas, it was even more emphasized. And so I don't know what's going on with the TT2 and the Amp 23R, because there was definitely a bit of a difference between the atriums and the Calderas between those, where I kind of flipped my opinion. Whereas with the GT, I absolutely preferred the Amp 23R, regardless of what I was listening to. And I also should add here that I'm using exactly the same interconnects for all of these tests. Specifically, I'm using Curious Evolved XLRs, where it's XLR connections, and Curious Evolved RCA, where it's RCA connection. Now, recognizing that this is a long video, and thanks for sticking with me, or for jumping forward to the bits you're interested in, I've got two more quick comparisons to do. The next one is the Passlabs HPA1. I got this one in second hand specifically so I could compare it to the Amp 23R, and that's because I knew that the Passlabs HPA1 uses a low feedback design. I don't believe it's a zero feedback design, but it's deliberately low feedback. Listening to Not To Blame by Joni Mitchell, and the atriums on the HPA1, the sound was good, but it was probably just a little bit dry for me. And what I mean by that is the upper mid range just felt a little bit kind of overly textural. It didn't have the smoothness and the naturalness that I was looking for. Another thing I noticed with the HPA1 is it wasn't separating the sounds in quite the same way. Now I should pause for a moment and say that I absolutely love the HPA1. When I decided to move it on and get the SPL Phonator that's over behind me, I was actually a little bit sad to see it go because one of the things the HPA1 does incredibly well is its bass quality. I don't think I've heard another amp that gives you the sense of bass extension and control and body that the HPA1 does. It does it beautifully. Now, I haven't compared it with lots of things, so there could be plenty out there that do it. But in my brief comparisons between the HPA1 and the Burson Soloist GT and then the Amp 23R, I was incredibly impressed with the bass quality of the HPA1. Unfortunately, though, when it was put up against the Amp 23R, it was a bit of a no contest because of that lack of separation and also that slightly dry sound. I feel like the Amp 23R just immediately opened up the sound more. The HPA1 has a fairly kind of closed in, not a, not a congested sound, but a less open, a less spacious sound. It doesn't separate things into their spaces in the soundstage in quite the same way as something like the Amp 23R. Admittedly, the Amp 23R is exceptional in that regard. And so for me, whether it was the Atrium or the Caldera, the Amp 23R was clearly better again. And so at this point, what I was finding was that the Amp 23R was consistently sounding better. To me, it was consistently justifying an increased price. And I pause there because I don't want to say it justified its price tag because that's very personal. But in each case, what I was hearing was a sound that was better than the alternative that I had next to it. I think it's better than the Soloist GT in many ways. Admittedly, the GT is going to give you a little bit more insight into texture and detail if that's important to you. But the Amp 23R is going to give you that more natural, more open and spacious sound with all those individual images very clearly defined. The same is true with the HPA1, where the HPA1 does have its strengths with that bass control and extension, but the Amp 23R is just so much more natural. But I did have one more amp that I was really curious to test, and that was the Linear Tube Audio MZ3. Now the reason I was so keen to test these is that both of these are also speaker amps, and that both of these are going to have similar distortion characteristics. The Linear Tube Audio is a ZOTL amplifier, 
And so that means you're getting the distortion characteristics of tubes, which are not dissimilar to the distortion characteristics of the AMP23R. For this test, I was using It Don't Matter by Jacob Collier, and the atriums were delivering just an amazing combination of spatial accuracy and that sense of articulation, that sense of feeling the leading edges of notes, the energy in them. And in fact, what I wrote in my notes was that listening to the atriums with the Enlium Amp 23R, it was like you're sitting in a bedroom with the musicians. And I say bedroom because it was a fairly small space, but it was like being surrounded by the musicians and being able to hear everyone in their place in the soundstage. Moving over to the MZ3, which off the top of my head is about half the price of the Enlium Amp 23R, and this for me was the closest comparison. The MZ3 doesn't have quite the sense of energy and attack and articulation, but it's giving you the same wonderful sense of space. You can hear each of the sounds in their place in the soundstage, a lovely naturally shaped soundstage as well. It just didn't quite have that same sense of attack, and I don't mean attack in the aggressive sense, so much as just feeling the leading edges of those notes. And so that was with the Atrium. Again, moving out of the Calderas, I felt like everything got even better again from the Amp 23R. And that was a fairly consistent theme, I say, as my light goes off in the background. Sorry about that, I've been recording all morning and it's run out of juice. What I found was that consistently the Calderas perform better on the Amp 23R. But I wanted to clarify that that's not because they're planers. I've moved through all sorts of different dynamics and planers on the Amp 23R and on all these other amps, and the reason that the Caldera is coming out ahead of the Atrium is that it's just a more technically capable headphone. It's got a greater sense of resolution, a greater sense of attack, a more kind of neutral and linear tonality, and while that's not to say that I'd necessarily prefer it over the Atrium, I do definitely think it's more technically capable. And so I just wanted to clarify, I'm not sitting here for a second suggesting that the Amp 23R is specifically a planar magnetic headphone amp. What I'm saying is that the better the headphone you give it, the better the performance comes out. It just so happens that at the moment, my best performing dynamic headphone is the Atrium, whilst my absolute best performing headphones are options like the HE1000SE, the Mesa Elite, and the ZMF Caldera. And I'll cover all that off in the ZMF Caldera review, but that's the clarification here. This is a magnificent amp, regardless of whether you're driving dynamics, planers, ribbon headphones like the Graal CA1A, all of those are gonna be incredible. And so to close things out now, the final thing that I wanted to mention, and I'll go into this in another review later in more depth, but the final thing I wanted to talk about was the performance of the Amp 23R as a speaker amp. Because that's really the final piece of the puzzle in terms of its value, or whether it is value to you. Running the Amp 23R being fed by the Cord Hugo TT2, and then driving the Harbeth P3ESRXD speakers. With that particular setup, I tested out the Amp 23R up against the Linear Tube Audio MZ3 and also my Elekit TU8200R, which is quite heavily modified. In short, what I found was that the Amp 23R does continue to come out on top, but it's not to say that it's better in all areas. Listening to a track like In Fashion by Gregory Porter, and what I found was that the Linear Tube Audio MZ3 had a slightly greater sense of space in the soundstage, but on the other hand, the Amp 23R gives a bit more focus to the sound. Each of the images of the different sounds within the soundstage is a bit better focused. And so it's the question of whether you want that absolute precision of the placement of sounds or a bit more overall space. Both are fantastic amplifiers, it's just a different presentation. I also feel like the Amp 23R delivers a bit more authority when it needs to. Whereas the MZ3 and also the Elekit TU8200R are a little bit lighter in their sound. They're not thin sounding amplifiers, but they don't have the grunt and the kind of presence that the Amp 23R delivers. What that also translates to is I feel like the Amp 23R has a better sense of control over the drivers. You can feel that it's really controlling everything that happens. Everything's tight, everything's precise. But I should make it really clear that both, and I should say all because the Elekit's in there as well, all of these are very resolving, very detailed speaker amps. There's a high pitch ringing sound. You can hear one example at around two minutes 20 in this track. And it's a high pitch ringing that's probably something resonating with the percussive hitting of the piano. You can hear that sound from all of these really, really clearly. It's very defined, it's very clear, and I've never noticed it before. And so for me, that speaks to a combination of the quality of each of the amps and also obviously the speakers too. And so for me, comparing the Amp 23R to the LTA MZ3, I think the MZ3 comes very, very close in many ways. The things for me that separate it though and make the Amp 23R potentially worth more money is that the Amp 23R does have that better sense of control, that better sense of precision, that better sense of imaging focus. And that's true for headphones and also for speakers. And it's also got significantly more power. I found with the P3ESRXD that I was almost maxing out the output on the LTA MZ3. 
so where most of my listening from the Amp 23R is probably sitting around the 10 to 11 o'clock mark, I was up around 80, even almost a 90% volume from the MZ3. And so whilst both sounded great, I would be worried that if I needed more volume for a low level track, or if I was ever going to try different speakers that are a bit less efficient than the Harbeths, that's going to cause problems with the LTA MZ3, and it's not with the Amp 23R. With the Elekit TU8200R, I feel like it was also getting close to the sound of the Amp 23R, but it lacked the refinement. It could sound a little bit brittle and aggressive up top sometimes. Obviously that depends on the tubes that you're using and how much you want to invest in tubes. But again, what it was showing me was that there's a reason that some people will choose to spend money to get the Amp 23R. And I mean more money over and above something like the MZ3 or the TU8200R. And so that's a good segue, I think, into where I want to close this off. And that is to say that there is no doubt in my mind that the Amp 23R is a very unique product for very specific purposes. I don't think I could justify saying to you, buy this to just drive speakers. I also don't think I could say buy this to just drive headphones unless you're looking for the absolute best of the best sound out there. Assuming you like the sound of what I've described in terms of that sense of naturality, that sense of space, that sense of imaging focus. It's not the last word in detail retrieval. It's not lagging in detail retrieval, but I do think that if you're an absolute detail freak, you might enjoy something like the TT2, or indeed the Phonator behind me is fantastic as well. That's the Phonator XE. I think there are other amps that if you're just looking for detail and texture, and you're not worried about that soundstage presentation, there are other amps for nearly half the price of this that are going to perform probably as well as you need it to. But if you absolutely love that sense of naturality, if you love that sense of articulation and energy in the music while still having a very natural and smooth delivery of the sound, then that's where I think the Amp 23R is great. So as I said, if you're only buying it for headphones or speakers, you need to A, have lots and lots of money, but B, really be looking for the top-notch performance in those areas I just described. On the other hand, if you're somebody like me and you're looking at having both a headphone and a speaker set up on a desktop, sort of smaller, near-field type system, then that's where I really see something like the Amp 23R coming into its own. There's nothing I've tried in all the gear that I've got here at the moment that can come close to this in driving speakers and driving headphones. Others can drive headphones really well, but not speakers. Then there are those that can drive both, but they don't do either quite as well. And so that's really where I see the benefits of this one. If you're just going to go and drive speakers only, then you can probably save some money and get yourself a dedicated power or integrated amp. And if you're just going to drive headphones, then it's going to be a hard call whether or not you should just go with something like the Soloist GT or maybe the Fonita XE behind me. Even the Past Labs HPA1 has its strengths. And so for me, that's where the value in this one lies. The value is for a small, compact system where you're going to be using both headphone and speaker functionality. Or if you specifically want a very compact, fantastic sounding amplifier for a near field setup, maybe you're not going to use headphones that often, but size and performance are important to you. That's really where I see this being a niche product. And so coming back around to value, it's not a value purchase for everybody. But for those of you that like what I've had to say, for those of you that are happy to spend this level of money because you're in that pursuit of the sort of sound that I've described, I think the Amp 23R is nothing short of exceptional. So much so that I'm trying to find a way to finance a purchase of it for myself. I'm selling a whole bunch of gear at the moment on Aussie Audio Mart, eBay, etc. They'll probably all be sold by the time this video comes out. But that's the level of enjoyment that the Amp 23R has given me. It's absolutely wowed me. It's blown me away with some of the things it does. And therefore, it's an amp that I absolutely want to keep in my system. The good news for you is that that means I can now officially transition into reviewing speakers in the future. And so as I said before, make sure that you hit the subscribe button if you want to see more speaker reviews. And also do me a favor, hit the like button as well, because that's also going to let me know that this is a product, or more to the point, the setup that it provides me with in terms of having near-field speakers, that near-field speaker reviews are also of interest to you. So hit the like button, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and as always, I hope you found this video useful, helpful, informative, etc. Thanks for sticking with me, I know it was a long one, but for now let me leave it to the music, so happy listening, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound. Mm -hmm.